On today's episode of Locked On Suns, the Phoenix Suns have a top defense in the early going of the NBA season. Can it continue and what can we learn from their performance so far? Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons, a writer at suns.com, and the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcasts. A big thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen. Happy Tuesday, Suns game day. Happy Halloween. The uh, arrival of Victor Wembanyama in Phoenix, a fun matchup for sure. Hit follow, hit subscribe if you have not already if it's your first time finding the show or you just have been missing out we're free and available everywhere including youtube so just hit that button you'll get this show in your feed monday through friday from here on out all season long today's show is brought to you by game time the best place to get a ticket download the game time app create an account use the code locked on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase in between game day show today, so we are going to touch on a little bit of everything defensively, and I will close with thoughts on how Booker and Beal might change things when they return to this team. For a reminder, the Suns have been off to a solid, a very solid start defensively this year. Now, of course, taking any three-game sample, things can look very wonky, but the reason that I will say that I trust it is, one, we're going to break down more than just the numbers, so we're not just going off of the numbers, but also they've faced pretty good competition. I know the Lakers aren't exactly the best offense in the NBA, but that is an elite team that got good production out of its star players. The Nuggets, obviously, we know what they can do, uh, and the Jazz, it was just one of those where they dominated, and they should have, and so I think you can trust that as well. There aren't a lot of outcomes of this first week from the Suns where I'm going to raise my eyebrows or think something is off or an outlier. The Suns are number four in defense. Again, three games. Most teams have played a max of three games. I don't think anybody in the league has played four games yet as I'm recording this Monday before the games uh, tonight. But fourth, they are fourth in effective field goal percentage allowed, and they are 11th in forcing turnovers. And I talked with Brandon on Monday's show about how that turnover Number is what I'm going to focus on first and foremost as we go forward. Can they be a team that really turns defense into offense, really swarms you, makes you make mistakes, and uses the size that the Suns emphasized in the offseason to their benefit? And again, just mean uh, mugging the opponent, just blocking shots, stealing the ball, swarming passing lanes. That's what I want to see going forward. But let's talk about where they've been what we've seen, what they've been doing to get that solid first week mark in terms of defensive rating. Let's start with pick and roll defense first and foremost. I'll do a little good first, a little bad to close the segment. We'll talk isolation defense and transition defense, and then again, close with the star players who are on the mend and what they could bring to this team. But pick and roll defense on the good side first. We knew that when the Suns hired Frank Vogel, one of the main things that the defense was going to be able to do and that he was going to bring was taking away the paint. And I spent a lot of time talking about offensively and defensively how the scheme and the roster were better set up this year for the Suns to own the interior, own the paint, own the bucket at the rim. And they've done that, I think. And schematically... The result of that is they make the opponent space the floor expertly, perfectly, or they make the opponent move the ball at an elite level. It's one or the other. If you're not doing one or both of those things, you're wasting your half-court possession because Frank Vogel has coached these guys already. I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say that if there's not a pick-and-pot big man, if the big man who sets the screen in this ball screen defense um, or ball screen set for the offensive team, if that guy is rolling to the basket, it's not an exaggeration to say that all five Suns defenders might have a foot in the paint by the time the ball handler is driving toward the basket. You know, 
Um, like, let's pick an example. Uh, Anthony Davis, right? I think the Lakers at times don't always space the floor that great. And so if you have, you know, somebody who just made a cut, who hasn't fully gotten to that three-point line by the time the ball handler is driving, that was often like LeBron, and you have Davis rolling to the basket, and you have mediocre shooters like, let's say, you know, Vincent and Hachimura or something around that, um, well, I guess there would be three shooters, whatever, then the Suns are collapsing. And they might literally have five dudes, including Nurkic at the basket, the recovering point of attack defender, Kogi or Goodwin or whoever it is, and then all of their spot-up spacer defenders are into the paint. And it works. They've forced a lot of turnovers that way. They have forced a lot of bad shot attempts. You saw a lot of those Jordan Clarkson fadeaways. And, you know, um, obviously it took LeBron kind of just shoving it down their throats to uh, basically um, get anything in the downhill driving game for the Lakers offense. The other good on the pick and roll defensive side of things is Individual players are really moving, are really working, and that's what you want to see early in the season, right? Like, obviously, Josh Akogi or even Kevin Durant, like Grayson Allen to a degree, like those guys have the reputation that you would think, okay, of course that's what you're going to see. But I would add, um, you know, Jordan Goodwin has been a, a breath of fresh air. The fact that he's gotten to play, I think, has helped them win some of these games because they haven't been able to overpower offensively but they've been able to lift themselves on the other side of the floor as a result of him playing and, and others. I think Eubanks is somebody who moves well, but it's really, it's effort, right? They're going to shade toward the paint, but then they often might have to recover. Sometimes when they're shading toward the paint in that help situation, they're not actually going to plant themselves in the lane or whatever. They are just trying to keep the offense second guessing itself. And that level of, kind of jittery jitterbugness that they are are executing is just as much of an impact in terms of you know like Sam Darnold on Monday Night Football seeing ghosts right like you got to kind of get in the opposing team's head a little bit and that's what you're seeing the Suns do Uh, and then just look I think this is something to watch when Booker and Beal return but again because Goodwin has been playing because Akogi earned that starting spot uh, because even like Allen has been playing more I think he's been up and down, but those guys have been able to really keep the ball in front of them and prevent dribble penetration to a, a pretty solid degree. I think Chris Paul was able to to get into the teeth of the defense a little bit. I even think D'Angelo Russell was, but on the whole, I think the Suns have done a good job of that. On to the bad real quick. I think the Suns are exploitable on point of attack switches still. So especially when it's not Goodwin or Akogi defending that screen, like there were a couple where uh, Allen or Gordon or uh, some of the bigger players are having to fight through that screen or communicate or get the timing right with a big man or with another forward or wing or whatever. And the communication and timing is just off. That's where you've seen a lot of Suns mistakes happen where they want to switch that screen, but especially if Nurkic is not involved. But when that happens, one of the guys isn't quite on the same page and all of a sudden that ball handler is taken off. And I think the other part of this is with that extreme help, with the fact that the weak side kind of low man helper is going to be so far into the paint to help protect the rim, um, that's a lot of the time like Yuta Watanabe, when it's not Durant, it can be Yuta Watanabe. And I think the younger helpers, especially little, have gotten a little mixed up there. You're kind of zoning up, you're guarding both the low man's corner Uh, shooter and your own wing shooter at the same time you're having to kind of read the the, what your teammates are doing as helpers and you're having to read what the offense is doing and try to contest both of those shooters when they catch the ball and not be caught napping if they move if they cut if they relocate and I think you've seen a couple mistakes there but those are tiny things and it's week one I think you have to be pretty optimistic I think you also have to be very optimistic about the transition defense for sure as well as the isolation defense, especially against Anthony Davis. We'll break that down next. First, today's show brought to you 
by FanDuel. Score early this season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, and the official sports book of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 straight into your pocket if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is easy to use. They pay out immediately, and it just makes sports more fun if you're into it, if it's your thing. If it's not, try it out because maybe you never knew. I'm not talking about $300 units. I like to go ahead and spend within my budget. It just makes it a little more fun to follow. The Suns are 7.5-point favorites on Tuesday against the San Antonio Spurs. There's spreads, player props, over-unders, and more across the website. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Kick off the NFL season. FanDuel official partner of the NFL. Keeping it rolling, let's go through the other areas of defense so far. The Phoenix Suns had a an interesting test when they faced the Los Angeles Lakers last Thursday against Anthony Davis in particular. Now, LeBron is not quite at the age where he is going to post up or face up or do those types of things over the course of a game. It's just not reasonable. The guy is almost 40 years old, but Anthony Davis will do that, and When he is getting fouled, when he is putting pressure on the basket, they can be pretty hard to guard, even if he has his limitations as a jump shooter. So let's break this down a little bit. I think it's pretty simple. I mean, it's obviously simple. Defending isolations should be a matter of IQ and effort at the end of the day. The the defense is not having to really rotate all that much. Um, But again, the Suns play aggressively. And so what you're seeing is it was pretty, uh, I mean... A great player is going to be able to read it, but it didn't happen enough where we saw the next chess move. But really what the Suns did is they sent the corner, opposite corner, the weak side low man, same as I was just talking about with some of the pick and roll stuff, aggressively across the entire paint to basically be a second, a rim protector between the big man guarding Davis and the basket. What that means is, again, that wing slot, defender who's guarding the floor spacer that's up above on the wing that guy has to keep an eye on the corner guy and his own guy then you have the person at the top of the key potentially closing in you have if anybody cuts that's basically permission to consolidate and just take the way take away the paint completely and try to smack a pass away if one of them get if, if a pass does get sprayed over the top of you once the defense is just smashing into the paint it's kind of fun it's kind of cool I love the aggressiveness it's fun to watch um, what you see though is I think the first effort for that can be a little delayed I thought Durant did a good job of immediate I don't know if it was on the catch on the dribble I don't know if they mixed that up those are normally what you'll hear coaches say are the timing of when that help should be coming if it was Durant I feel like it was executed really well But even then, not every time. And if it wasn't Durant, less so, right? And if that's delayed, then it just isn't as effective because you're giving the offensive player, Davis, of course, as I said, time to read it. You're also giving the other players on the offense time to cut or relocate. You're just making your intentions known to your opponent in a way that makes it less effective. Um, And then I think, too, even if that first initial help is there, the second effort isn't always. So let's say... For instance, um, D- Davis saw that Durant was coming and dribbled the other, like spun the other direction, went went over his left shoulder back toward the paint to try to get a hook or a layup or whatever away from Durant. Well, you, what you want is everything to kind of rotate from there, right? Maybe you have um, that wing guy who is guarding the two shooters on the opposite side of the floor. Maybe he comes in. Maybe the guy at the top of the key then sinks all the way over. It kind of becomes, there are rules. Maybe I'm not smart enough to whip them off right now for you. But the point that I'm making that I am smart enough to observe is that that did not instantaneously happen. And so you saw a lot where if Davis was able to kind of beat that first coverage, there was an open pass for him. Or there was somebody untouched for an offensive rebound. Or on and on. And that can't really happen. On the other end, if we're talking about effort, we have to talk about the transition defense. And that's been, I mean, just pretty ironclad so far. It, I, I asked Frank Vogel about it the first time that I ever asked him a question. And he was 
definitely not trying to reinvent the wheel. His teams always defend in transition, but he did not really put it any differently than any other coach I've ever heard. It's about effort. It's about intensity. It's about commitment. And this team has just done that. I mean, flat out, I don't think there's much more to say. They are allowing the 19th fewest. So they're almost in the top 10 in a transition frequency allowed by their opponent, but they are limiting the impact that that's able to have on the, on the opposing team's offense, and they are um, limiting teams to a bottom 10 offensive rating in transition, all right? So they're allowing those opportunities a lot because they keep turning the ball over, but so far it hasn't bitten them, which means at times, uh, especially off of rebounds, when teams try to run, the Suns are just getting back and stopping them, and that's really great to see. That's what you've always seen Vogel teams do, but... Uh, still early in the season with a new roster and injuries and obviously fluctuations to the rotation already, you have to be pretty pleased with the fact that they've been able to execute it. On the note of fluctuation in the rotation, we don't know for sure that Devin Booker and Bradley Beal will be back Tuesday. Maybe it'll be Thursday. I'm not going to guess that, but what I will do is tell you what to expect when they do come back so that you're ready for it no matter when it happens. We'll do that next. First, today's show brought to you by Game Time. And look, I know the perfect use for Game Time, which is the best place to buy any ticket you want, the World Series. You might have heard. It is in Phoenix right now, and tickets sold out. Congratulations to us for showing that we can be a baseball town, but also... Not congratulations to anyone who missed out on that. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event and game time gives you the peace of mind. Last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals. They show you the view from your seat and they have a lowest price guarantee and event event cancellation protection, job loss protection, and more. They basically took all the feedback that anyone could have given them about the stuff that the other ticketing apps don't have. They put it on theirs and they made it the best one out there. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view, all in prices on the front end, and you can buy those tickets in seconds with just two taps once you know the deal is the one you want. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code LOCKDOWNNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code LOCKDOWNNBA. That's L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price. Guaranteed. Let's close out the show. One thing apiece to watch for with Bradley Beal and with Devin Booker. I'm going to return a little bit back to what we saw with the, uh, pick, what we talked about with the pick and roll defense. Can the Suns maintain that basic? stepping stone that they've been able to have as a defense by keeping the ball in front of them and guarding the pick and roll ball handler well for the most part anybody not named like LeBron James or Jamal Murray can they continue that or not Jamal Murray they haven't played Jamal Murray uh Steph Curry I think is what I meant to say um with Beal again I don't think Allen necessarily did the best job on Chris Paul for instance I don't think he did the best job even on D'Angelo Russell. So maybe Beal could do better. I mean, I, I'm open to that. <clears throat> but especially if, and this is connected to something that I brought up with Brandon yesterday, if Beal's return in particular makes it so that Jordan Goodwin does not play anymore, people took that as an insult to Jordan Goodwin. And I think we did a pretty good job of describing this on Monday's show, but I'll say it again in case it got lost in translation or something. I It has nothing to do with... Jordan Goodwin. We were talking, and I still believe that Frank Vogel will keep this rotation pretty limited. And so there's only so many players who are going to play. If you're telling me two star level guards are coming back, I'm probably going to assume a guard is who loses their place in the rotation. It would be a little weird if the Suns brought back Booker and Beal and suddenly Yudawat Nabe is the guy not playing or something. That's not likely. So if Goodwin stops being in the rotation, they put Beal on some of those players more often. They lose a little bit of size, defensive intensity, etc. Can their defense hold up against that? Do you have Nurkic then getting into foul trouble more? Do you have guys uh, helping even more aggressively because there's not as much pushback against the ball handler into the paint and then you're having leakage where 
shooters are more open, guys are cutting, whatever it is. Can they maintain their defensive integrity starting with Beal? That's the question when I think about him. When I think about Booker and uh, even just kind of the two of them, I think the obvious thing is beyond that, um, the offense. Are we going to see, I mean, you, you look up and the Suns are scoring 126 points against the Utah Jazz on Saturday night mostly by turning defense into offense and getting just a classic, efficient Kevin Durant performance. Can they do that or more on even better efficiency and even easier night on the job with all their players? I mean, we just have not seen that. But again, when you compare it to some of the performances we've still been able to see, like if the Suns score a normal amount of points against the Lakers in that fourth quarter instead of 11, um, even then you're probably looking at a pretty good night. The Suns scored, uh, let's see, in the first three quarters of that game, they had 84 points. Like, what if they score another 30? We're talking about a, a 115 type of night. On Tuesday last week, they were at 108. They almost, you know, had four 30-point quarter or three 30-point quarters, and then one letdown quarter again. What if you just start to see the staggering of the stars, the efficiency, all that just add up to where they're just putting the sledgehammer down on these teams. And I think it's obviously within reason. That's why the roster was built this way. And I don't exactly think that the San Antonio Spurs are the team to uh, to beat there, right? Uh, I'm looking at the injury report that came out as I'm recording this, which I thought might happen. Booker is doubtful Tuesday. Beal is out on Tuesday. That's a bummer, but I just wanted to give you guys my thoughts because it might be Thursday, it might be Saturday in Philadelphia. We'll just have to keep up with how they all recover, but those are the two things that I'm watching. Can the point of attack defense keep up, and what is the ceiling on the offense? That will wrap us up. Hit follow, hit subscribe if you have not already. Announcement coming later this week on some new Locked On Suns insider content that you guys are going to have access to soon once I get the word and obviously recaps of both Spurs games, next weekend's uh, road trip, and more, all coming on the feed. So hit that button, and I will talk to you guys next time.